Hi, I'm Michael Killen. This is a live taping of a work in progress film, Painting to Change the World. And my guest is the head of Earth Sciences for NASA Ames. And I'm going to ask him a series of questions about what is NASA doing with our money, our taxpaying money? Are they continuing to just send up rockets and satellites plan for sending people to Venus or where, whatever, what are they doing to help us understand what's happening to this planet, what's happening to you and me, what is the impact of climate change on all the species? Before I start inter interviewing Steve Hipskin, I want to say something about the development of the movie that we're working on, Painting to Change the World. This month, the art exhibition that comprises several of the paintings that are part of, that are documented in the movie, are being shown in an exhibition at the Palo Alto City Hall. And it starts September the 20th and it runs through October 29th. And this is a very special art exhibition. It's dedicated to the great Dr. Steven Schneider, one of the great climatologists in the world who passed away recently. And he was the scientist at Stanford who promoted this art exhibition more than anyone else. And I'm pleased that the city of Palo Alto has decided to be the first organization to show this art exhibition. By the way, this is a photo of a fellow from the Carnegie Institute of Science, Marion O'Leary. He's a scientist. And, and this, is part of, this is part of the process of how I make these paintings. These great scientists come in. They share their insights, just like Steve Hipskin is going to do today. It helps give me the ideas, the symbols for making the paintings. And this painting is the end of the oil, oil era. Can we see uh, some more photos? This is sort of just a group of posters that have emerged from the paintings. And I'll, I'll mention what the first one is to give everyone an idea what they are. The first one is climate change for the wealthy. The second one is climate change for the rest of us. And it's on this set tonight. And the third one is the beginning of the end. And you can think about that. And the last one is liberty fused to oil and coal. And I'm getting, what else do we have here in terms of images? And then I'll move on with my guests. This is a large photo of the poster, Climate Change for the Wealthy. And uh, any more? OK, I'm ready. Steve, thank you. Well, it's great to be here, Michael. I'm really pleased to be part of your uh, endeavor. Earth Sciences. And you're the chief of the NASA Ames facility in Mountain View? Correct. So you heard me mention before NASA is known for, for sending things up and trying to explore, I guess, uh, the galaxies, the universe, or whatever. And what do you do? So uh, we actually take NASA's unique perspective from space, and we actually look back at our home planet. And so you know, most people think of the Apollo program, the, the Hubble Space Telescope, but we, NASA actually has the largest Earth science program on the planet. Uh, we use, we use that, the, the unique suite of tools that we have developed, uh, the space-based uh, observations. We use aircraft, and we use computer models to really study the Earth as a global system. So wherever we go, we hear the word sustainability, right? Correct. Why do we hear that word? now more than ever. And then I'm going to come back to NASA. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, we like to think that it goes back to those early days of the space program where the first Apollo astronauts circled, circled the moon before they landed on the moon. 
And one of the iconic images that they returned was that classic image of the Earth rising over the moon. And it was the first time that we all got to see this small spaceship that we call Earth floating in that infinite space of, of the universe. And it really brought home the idea that we are on this finite planet. And, and the way that we're going to maintain that planet is to use sustainable um, practices. I, by, by the way, I like the way you went right back to sustainability it's, and, and the word finite. It is a realization, and, and you correct me, a realization that the natural resources of this planet are now, we can see the end of many of them, and that could have, that is already having an adverse effect on all the species, including us. Would that be correct? Well, it, it, it's certainly true that there are, there are two sort of huge factors uh, impacting resources on the planet. I mean, one is just simply the number of people and the, uh, the demand for resources and the growing demand with the growing population. And then on top of that, you have climate change that has the potential of changing the distribution of those resources, particularly things like water. So, um, yeah. All right. Population, explosion, and this thing called climate change. So the way you say it, you're saying you really believe that climate change is happening. Well, uh, certainly climate change has happened throughout the history of the Earth. There's no question of that. I mean, that by definition is, uh, you know, the way that the weather changes over time is, is climate. Um, there, there, I mean, but what we're seeing now is that the planet is warming, and that's you know, when people refer to climate change, it's really the warming of the planet. And, and there's no doubt that that's occurring. And, you know, we have a vast array of evidence from space-based observations that NASA makes, from uh, surface observations that are made around the world by, you know, many people, many countries, many organizations. So there's uh, very conclusive proof. I mean, there's no doubt that the uh, planet has warmed significantly in the last 100, 150 years. And it's warming at a faster rate than, than? Well, currently, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, uh, a lot of these things are, are uh, happening at a faster rate than we had predicted. Um, you know, as we talked about before, we use models to predict into the future. And a lot of those models were actually fairly conservative compared to what we're seeing now, particularly, for example, with the Arctic ice the uh, ice, uh, the sea ice in the Arctic and the loss. Maybe we'll come back to the Arctic ice. Now, NASA has more satellites than anyone? Um, we uh, certainly, uh, we have more uh, satellites up there observing the Earth than any other single entity. And you have planes that are also circling parts of the Earth with various types of in Yes. Yeah, so, so basically, what happen, What what we do is we have the the spacecraft give us the broad perspective, the global perspective of the Earth, and and NASA really in this country is the only organization that does really take that global view. Uh, but then we we also have a suite of aircraft which we can instrument, which we can then send to specific areas or or to look at specific phenomena, so that we can get much more detailed observations of the specific phenomena that we want to study. Of the Earth, and maybe not counting the ocean, but maybe you want to do that, do you, your organization, Total NASA, have the best view of what's happening to the Earth, the atmosphere, of anyone? Well, uh, of course, that's a bit of a loaded question because, I, I mean, this is such a big global complex problem that while it's true that NASA has more uh, resources looking at the Earth at one time, uh, it's, it's part of a, of a global effort um, of, on the part of other countries, um, on the part of other organizations, uh, other agencies within this country. Um, so, so although we have probably more uh, uh, focus on Earth studies with our satellites. Uh, it's certainly 
uh, in that vast array of resources that the, that the globe brings to bear on the problem. So there are these folks around who are, are called skeptics who do not believe that we are in a period of rapid climate change and, and that it's threatening and that it's filling, not filling, but putting a lot of carbon dioxide and other trace gases in the atmosphere. A and they say that's not the case. Uh, am I correct that there are the skeptics who say well, something like that? There, there, there are certainly skeptics. Um, and I, I think there are very few skeptics that don't, that, don't, that don't believe that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased. I mean, we have you know, absolutely rock solid evidence uh, conclusive observations that the CO2 is increasing very, very ra rapidly. Um, and, and, you know, there's no doubt that the temperature of the planet has changed considerably over the last, you know, roughly since the Industrial Revolution when we started using fossil fuels uh, in, in a much more significant way. Um, I think, you know, what, what uh, the skeptics tend to argue is that, you know, there, there's not a conclusive connection between that increasing CO2 in the atmosphere and uh, human impact on, on the, I mean, they, they tend to argue that humans are so insignificant that they can't have much of an impact on the globe. What do you think of that? Well, I, I think the evidence is quite clear that um, it, it, you know, there's no doubt that the CO2 has a warming effect. It's the greenhouse effect. And, and we understand the physics of that pretty well. And the real evidence is that, you know, when, when we develop these numerical models to understand all of these observations that we take and then try to make predictions into the future, uh, the only way that you can match the, um, you know, what's going on with the observations is if you include both natural forcings as well as the CO2, the greenhouse effect. If you try to do it with one or the other, you just can't match the observations of what's really going on. So it's uh, quite conclusive. The IPCC uh, uh, basically you know, is a consensus of scientists around the world, and they came to the same conclusion. So you have the satellites, the planes, you got the supercomputers, you got the models, you got a lot of data coming in, probably more than anyone else. And, and you conclude, your organization, that climate change is uh, made to a good extent by human actions, okay? Now, I was just wondering, I have a brother-in-law, and he says you and all the other scientists are part of some kind of plan working with the politicians to control us. I mean, how do you handle well, something? I, so that's, you know, that's where we come in, in that, I mean, the only way that we're really going to understand what's going on is if we continue to make these observations and, and really understand what, you know, what is going on. And it, climate change is such a, it, you know, it t tends to be on the scale of decades to hundreds of years. And so the only way that you can really tell what's going on is if you make measurements for a long enough time. And so... I think it's fundamentally important that, you know, that we get the best information that we can get. And one of the things about NASA that's, a, that's actually quite unique, and, and kind of in, in the United States in general, is that when we take that data, we make it public when we take it. So everybody in the world can look at that data, which is not the same around the world. Uh, it's, it's interesting that people are particularly the Europeans are starting to follow that lead and make their data more readily uh, public. But, uh, but, but one of the things about the effort that we make is, is not only to take the observations that will allow us to diagnose what's going on, but to make that readily available to anyone. All right. I know we have a photo of your satellites, and I'm not sure if the team has already shown it yet, but uh, I think that's... Uh, that's the uh, constellation of satellites that are that are currently up there. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. I, I, uh, my eyesight is not as good as it used to be, but I, uh, that looks like uh, the, the constellation that we have. Are you going to launch?